there's not been a lot of formal organization to the growth of the internet. So it's a little hard to talk about internet leadership as some defined um, process. But after 20 years working in computing and networking at Stanford, I left Stanford in 1986 to go to Washington to open an office for research universities to basically lobby for the internet. And my job there was to uh, in, uh, work on the Congress to see that they understood the potential value of internet technology and, and networking based on internet technology. Uh, we held a, a national conference that, that socialized the whole idea of, of uh, the internet as a basis, as a major foundation for future communication systems. Uh, after I left that job, I was asked to preside over a planning process that led to the creation of Internet 2. And Internet 2 was really a consortium of the major research universities that stepped in after the National Science Foundation gave up funding for NSFNet in order to create a consortium that would ensure that American universities had a leading position in, in uh, high performance networking, which of course by the time that this was going on in 1997 meant that it was going to be TCP IP technology. And when I was finished with that, I was somewhat coincidentally asked to become involved with the planning for ICANN. In other words, ICANN really grew out of a desire by the executive branch uh, and the Clinton administration to privatize the various research, uh, the various internet ac administrative activities that research agencies had been doing that really didn't belong there as the internet grew. So the, what the privatization process did was gather up a half a dozen different functions. One, for instance, is the, is the uh, IANA numbering activity and move it into a public nonprofit, public benefit corporation, which is what ICANN is. And since then, I've been a retired, semi-retired consultant, like a lot of internet people. There was a very tense period between 1984 and 1988 when the telecommunications companies were aggressively trying to <clears throat> uh, promote uh, their own view of where high-performance networking technology should go. And that view was uh, founded in a top-down com command and control engineering uh, model. Uh, those of us who were in the research universities who felt very strongly that the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, loosely connected internet technology was the way to go in order to build a more robust and scalable system really had to fight very hard. So when uh, the federal government decided in 1988, 1989, to uh, require federal agencies to use TCP IP, and then the budget office put some money into supporting, uh, you know, into federal support for internet technology, that was really turned the tide because it, it gave what had been a university activity, public credibility. You know, with, with the federal government and all its might and all its agencies and all its uh, thousands and thousands of millions of, of computers and networking and so on, going to use TCP IP technology, that couldn't be ignored. And people in Wall Street, for instance, who were inclined to believe the telephone companies a story on all of this. I mean, after all, these were places like Bell Labs that were claiming that internet technology would never work. I mean, they were they were very upfront saying, well, this won't work, it won't scale. That's They were still behaving like that as late as 1985 and 1986. So Wall Street, you know, looking at a bunch of academics versus a bunch of uh, multi-billion, hundred, multi-hundred billion dollar uh, uh, telephone company executives and engineers and so forth, uh, you know, they were, they were over on the telco side. So when the federal government uh, took a deep breath and went our way, that was, that was very much of a pivotal moment. The 
some people will tell you, well, it, it wasn't until uh, President Bush signed the High Performance Computing Act of 1991 that had $500 million a year for internet technology that that, that really was cast to die. But in fact, uh, all the decision process for that really culminated in 1988 and 1989. Also, I think you ought to, we ought we all ought to we all owe a debt uh, to the people at Michigan and IBM who partnered with the National Science Foundation to do NSFNet in 1987. Before 1987, internet technology was limited to a few hundred places that were uh, Defense Department sponsored sites. And it was hard to claim that that constituted any general academic use of internet technology. But, but NSFNet went from 100 campuses in 1988 to 1,000 connected uh, campuses in less than three years. So nobody could, deny, could, nobody could claim that it was a useless technology after that. The growth of the internet, like all phenomena, has limiting factors. You know, you're, you know, you've, you've seen the, you've taken econ courses and you've seen these curves of diminishing returns to scale and all, and that sort of thing. So one of the questions, appropriate questions about whether things are stormy or not is, well, as we look at the evolution of the internet over the next five or 10 years, what are the things that are gonna help it grow in a constructive, useful way and what are the things that are going to inhibit that growth. I think on balance today, uh, we are still in a very uh, a positive environment uh, for growth. Uh, the the uh, frontiers of the underlying technology are still being pushed very successfully. We, in other words, we haven't run out of the ability to continue uh, exponential growth rates. Uh, particularly with the, the uh, evolution, with the arrival of uh, smartphone technology, and very shortly wearables and implantables, and 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 the Internet of Things, all of those are have terrific multiplication factors in them. And so, you know, one of the, one of the questions you obviously have to answer is, well, what is the desirable limit for the Internet? That that question puts you back way over back into. Uh, uh, sociology and psychology and politics and and uh, human condition, if you will. Uh, we aren't anywhere close to saturation, but I would say that uh, we are in a period where we're running the, obst the the principal obstacles that the internet is running into today is a difficulty in extending the reach of of network access to the, the uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, several billion people on the planet, the people who have, don't have adequate access, don't have a decent st lifestyle to begin with, st any, any reasonable standard of living, don't have access to education, don't have access to a social fabric that gives them a, a sense of self-esteem and of progress. Uh, so uh, the remedies for that kind of problem are not in just spending more dollars on internet technology. It's a much more complicated question. So those of us who were around at the beginning, you know, there was a meeting in Washington in 1986. And in one room, there were about 300 people. And about 90% of the intellectual capital of the internet in the United States was in that room, 300 people. Today, they're, you know, we're, we're up into the millions in, in, in terms of that, of that kind of dis description. So we uh, are the victims to some extent of our own success because we all know that as organizations get larger, they have a lot of trouble being agile. Uh, and uh, you've, you've gone through this business yourself of, of coursework on self-renewal. How, how do corporations that get in trouble survive? Mostly they don't. More often than not, they don't. They, they, they fall by the wayside. You know, look at the railroad industry almost died when, when steam locomotives went away and that, and that sort of thing.
I'm a, from a generation of Americans that uh, went through college in the 50s and, and, and watched the kids that came after us uh, be so unhappy with the war, with the Vietnam War. But we hung on to our idealism, I think, in a less radical way. So that means that our, our, our view of, of uh, American, America and, and, and uh, Western civilization, if, if you want to put it that way, is that we've been a very positive force uh, for uh, progress in humanity and that our mastery of technology is really essential if, as you look to the channel challenges downstream in the next century. In the, the media likes to hype them all up about, you know, all, the, all of the coastal plains are going to be inundated the day after tomorrow and all these poor people are going to drown and so on. Well, it's not like that, but it is pretty serious. You know, there are vast areas of coastal plains that are densely populated that are going to be underwater within 50 years. So it's going it, to, it's one of the things that we're not making progress on that it's not clear what the internet can do for is that we have a worldwide employment problem. It's not only true in the United in the developed countries, but it's true even more so in the in the lesser developed countries. If we can't, that's really social dynamo. You know, you have all of these young people, especially young males, who you know can't get a job. They can't ask a girl to marry them. They can't go to a girl's father and say that they have a way to support her if if uh, he'll let him marry her daughter, his daughter. Uh, that's very frustrating. It's dyna absolute dynamite. So, and and it's a, and it's it's a definite obstacle to social progress. If I think you know much of what goes on in the Middle East, which Americans view as just this incredible religious nonsense, is is the 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 underlying problem there is all these young people that can't get a job, don't have any sense of uh, social uh, fulfillment in in their lives, or very little, and and a lot of that is biased by by uh, uh, theocratic uh, control that suggests that somehow or other going to a church or a mosque is going to solve the problem, and it's, and it's obviously not. So, uh, I would I would say that that uh, all of the technology that we're able to harness in which in 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 an awful lot of that a large fraction of that i wouldn't i wouldn't want to say all of it but like at least three quarters of all the new technological de development in human society in the next 50 years is going to be mediated by internet technology there's a saying you've probably seen in your courses uh, that uh, a startup enterprise comes to a point where it reaches a level of maturity when you have to fire the founders. You know, that the, in other words, the, the attributes and the strengths and the motivations that got the company launched and, and on, a, on a successful trajectory are not the ones that will sustain it. The, the internet the, you know, we still have almost all the pioneers with us and alive and then many contributing, but we're getting old and gray. And so I think that the new generation of leaders in the Internet, you know, the 30-somethings, the 40-somethings that we have today, their focus is going to be on identifying uh, uh, obst obstacles that are out there which are much more complicated to deal with than, I mean, we thought in the 70s and 80s, we were dealing with very complicated problems. Today's problems are are more complicated and and require more more intellect, more energy, more motivation. I think that that uh, you know my view of that, being coming out of an academic environment, uh, being a, a, an American educated in in one of our best universities, I have a lot of respect for learning. And I have a lot of respect for uh, the, the expectation of, of rigorous performance, if you will. In other words, you've probably had papers come back to you where the professor said, you know, basically you didn't, you didn't have this right and you didn't work hard enough on it. So it's really 
you know, this is not easy stuff. You, you, uh, you have to be smart, you have to be talented, you have to be motivated, and you have to work hard. So if, if we can continue to, and that's characteristic of Internet people, characteristic of the people that are going to get, are being honored here. If we can maintain that sort of uh, ethic and that culture, we'll be all right.